Thank you, Eugenio. A real pleasure to be here. Um, I was reflecting on the fact that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, old friends here from Bell Labs that I haven't seen in a long time, like Brian Ackland. And I haven't been to ISSCC in about 30 years. Um, I used to be a chip designer, but uh, I'm a little out of date um, to some extent, but hopefully not too much. Um, so, you know, of course, machine learning and AI is, is in the news. It's becoming uh, it's become very important over the last uh, few years. A lot of the big companies are now built around uh, AI and deep learning in particular. Uh, and uh, the, the topic, of course, has uh, piqued the interest of this community for, for a while. In fact, for a very long time. In fact, uh, you could say that to some extent, the history of AI is um, intimately linked with the, the history of hardware development. But what AI is today really is uh, supervised learning. So it's a particular mode of uh, you know, paradigm, a training paradigm for machines that consists in uh, showing examples to a parameterized function of what we want it to do and then giving it the correct answer and then uh, you know, letting it adjust its parameters so that the answer gets closer to the one we want. And by training such machines with generally millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of parameters, we can get them to do whatever function we want, like recognizing objects and images. This works amazingly well for speech recognition, image recognition, uh, generating captions for images, translating languages into one another, um, classifying text, etc. Uh, but it's uh, you know a very sort of specific form of learning which you know isn't really what's going to take us at least not by itself to uh, uh, truly intelligent machines. But if we go back to to the history of, uh, of of neural nets in particular, you know this goes back to the 1940s and 50s, in particular the 1950s with the perceptron, which of course was a was a hardware piece. It was an analog computer. Uh, where the weights, the adjustable weights of the neural nets were implemented by potentiometers with motors on them. So learning consisted in, you know, pressing a button and having motors turned. Um, uh, there were sort of competing uh, implementations like uh, Bernie Widrow's uh, Adeline system that used electrochemical cells. So um, what happened then uh, was um, the, the, the creation of the, the, the standard paradigm for pattern recognition that survived until fairly recently. In fact, it's still very widely used, where you take a, a signal, let's say an image, and you have some hand-engineered module that turns this image into what's called a feature vector, basically a big vector that you feed to a trainable classifier, and only the classifier is trainable. Um, now, in modern times, uh, neural nets have kind of changed this model a little bit. And, and there were some limitations to this model, and uh, basically people abandoned the idea that this model could be used for really sort of making progress towards AI. It was, of course, very successful for pattern recognition. Um, so that kind of caused the, a sort of neural net winter to appear from the late 60s to the mid 80s, roughly. Um, and one reason is, is, is hardware reasons, in fact, is because people had the, the wrong neurons. The neurons that people were using at the time were binary neurons. Um, and it kind of stopped people from thinking about uh, things like using gradient descent in multi-layer systems because you can't backpropagate gradient through binary neurons. And so it's only in the early 80s when uh, workstations with decent floating point performance started to appear that people started to think that it was reasonable to actually you know, do floating point multiplication uh, thousands of times or even tens of thousands of times uh, in, a, in a neural net. And that's when backpropagation, the idea that you can train multi-layer systems with gradient descent, uh, appeared. So to some extent, that was triggered by progress in the available hardware. Um, so the, what, what happened then is the, the idea that you can essentially stack multiple modules, each of which is trainable, and then train them end-to-end -end using a gradient descent-based uh, uh, method. Um, so what you put in those boxes are, in fact, very simple functions to implement uh, from the hardware point of view. Things like uh, multiplying a vector by a matrix and then uh, passing all the components of the output vector by a pointwise nonlinearity as simple as a half-wave rectifier. Uh, when I talk to computer scientists, I have to say what a hardware rectifier is, but in this room, I don't need to explain. Um, so, so you stack you you stack linear operators, mat matrix multiplication with pointwise nonlinearity. You can prove that with only two layers of those, you can approximate any function you want. But of course, uh, there is advantage in stacking multiple layers, and you get more powerful um, uh, representation of functions that way. So that's the idea of deep learning and neural nets, really. And you can train this using gradient descent. You minimize some sort of objective function. 
uh, with respect to all the parameters in your system, in the case of supervised learning, it measures the discrepancy between the output you want and the output you get using all, all types of fancy stochastic optimization methods. And to compute the gradient, you use what's called a backpropagation uh, algorithm, which uh, consists in basically running the circuit backwards uh, and uh, you know, a slightly modified version of the circuit backwards to kind of propagate gradients. It's basically a practical application of chain rules, so there's nothing really complicated in terms of mathematics there. And the idea has been around since the 60s, but for machine learning only since the, the mid 80s, roughly. Um, so I, um, uh, I joined um, Bell Labs in 1988, and the, the group I joined, which was uh, led by Larry Jackal at the time, uh, was um, actually focusing on building devices for neural nets. And they started by uh, building, this was before I joined, by building a um, resistor array, essentially using e-beam lithography. So they could uh, build incredibly small resistor arrays for the time. Um, and then realize, of course, the amplifiers you have to put at the, at the end of it are not that small. And so the advantage of you know, making small resistor arrays was not that great, and so they were not programmable. Um, so the second generation chip was sort of mixed analog digital, where the input output were digital, but the competition inside was, uh, was analog. And uh, the weights were ternary. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, you could sort of uh, combine multiple rows in one of those things to kind of get a little bit of bit depth uh, for the computation. The last chip, um, or the second last chip, I should say, that I kind of uh, participated in, uh, in this one, was the ANA chip, which was actually presented at ISSCC in 1991, I believe. Uh, and uh, that means uh, 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 analog neural net accelerator. Um, so, it used uh, about 6-bit resolution on the weights, about 3 bits on the activations of the neurons, and it had 64 neurons with 64 input each, each with uh, um, uh, sheet registers so that it could do multiple convolutions uh, efficiently. This was a convolutional net accelerator chip um, already in 1991. The project was actually started in 1989, roughly. Um, this was capable of 4 billion operations per second, which at the time was completely unheard of. Um, this was successful in the sense that technically uh, we could run character recognizers at 10,000 uh, recognitions per second, uh, but it wasn't a commercial success in the sense that nobody actually wanted to use it. Uh, by the time it was uh, all put in a card and everything, people lost interest in neural nets. Um, so a convolutional net is a particular architecture, a particular way of connecting neurons in a, uh, in a neural net in such a way that you don't um, you know, have to basically use a full matrix to multiply the input vector. So imagine you have an image, it's represented as an array of, uh, of pixels, and you basically run a convolution operation, discrete convolution operation uh, on this, where the coefficients of the filter are, are learned as part of the backpropagation process. So you don't design the filters, you just let the gradient descent algorithm figure out what the right filters are. And there is sort of several layers in a convolutional net, uh, banks of filters, followed by nonlinearity, followed by a pooling operation, which is basically just a max or an average of the response of the filters in a region. And the purpose of this is to build a little bit of shift invariance in the representation. This is very much inspired by uh, sort of neuroscience, classic neuroscience work from the 60s. Um, so uh, this is a video, actually, this is a younger version of myself here from uh, 1992, and this is actually my phone number at Bell Labs, uh, Homedale no longer operating. I hit a key, and there's a video camera that grabs the thing and then recognizes the, the, the characters. And it can do this at, you know, a few tens of characters per second. It's actually running on the DSP32C, which was one of the first uh, uh, floating-point DSP that at the time was manufactured by uh, AT&T, um, uh, just in a card stuck in a PC. So this could... Uh, uh, work pretty well. Um, and uh, this is sort of an example of how those, those things at the time kind of were, were working. The internal representation that is learned by the system is hierarchical because of the multiple layers. And uh, what you get inside is sort of some sort of representation, abstract representation that is more and more abstract as you go up the layers that kind of represents the, the, the character but learns to really extract the appropriate features uh, for the characters. We soon realized we could use those systems not just to recognize single objects but multiple objects without having to explicitly segment the objects from the others uh, uh, um, beforehand. And that's very important if you want to be able to detect uh, objects in natural images, for example, or separate uh, you know, characters from a cursive uh, word. Um, eventually, we put this together into a big system that could recognize bank checks, and this was um, uh, 
deployed pretty widely by NCR, which at the time was a uh, subsidiary of at &T. And by the end of the 90s, the system was reading around between 10 and 20% of all the checks in the US. So it's a big success, technology, you know, scientific, technological, and commercial. Um, and the very, the very same day that we uh, were celebrating the release of the system, uh, at and announced that it was breaking itself up, and the department was essentially disbanded. Um, it's typical. OK. Um, so what happened in the mid-90s is that there was, for some reason, that sociologists of science will have to explain, there was a second neural net winter. People in the machine learning community lost interest in those methods in the, in the 90s. And I think it's very interesting. So this is about the same time that we were releasing those systems. And it's interesting to understand why. Um, hardware was slow uh, for flow point computation. And so the size of the neural net you could train was kind of relatively uh, restricted, and it would take two weeks, typically, for a practical neural net to be trained. Uh, data was scarce, and neural nets were kind of data hungry. So there were only a few applications for which you could collect you know, economically uh, 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 feasible collection of data was, was only uh, uh, possible for a very small number of applications like character recognition, speech recognition. Um, this was before the internet, right? There was no fl you know, flood of data as we have today. Uh, interactive software tools to kind of do those things were, you know, had to be built from scratch. There was no Python, there was no MATLAB, you know, there was no such thing. You had to kind of build your own thing. So we actually ended up writing our own, our own Lisp interpreter and compiler uh, hooked up to kind of a neural net library, if you want. Uh, this is kind of the predecessor of all the modern uh, software frameworks for deep learning. And open sourcing was not common in the pre-internet days. And so it wasn't very easy to kind of communicate all the black magic and underlying knowledge that are necessary to make those things work. So a lot of people would try neural nets and you know, couldn't make it work and sort of concluded it didn't work. Um, so that created the winter, which was to last for another 10 years. Um, so um, one lesson also that we, we, we learned from our exper experience at Bell Labs is that it's hard to succeed with exotic hardware. Uh, in fact, the, the progress of the chips that we built went from you know, hardwired analog to programmable hybrid analog digital to completely digital. I didn't mention that chip, but it was eventually designed. Um, uh, hardware limitations influenced research direction. In, you know, computer scientists like to think that they think, they think in the abstract uh, and hope that the hardware will eventually support their ideas. But in fact, we actually are thinking is limited by the hardware we, we have at our, at our disposal. So whatever you guys are designing for the next decade will influence AI research. Okay, and so it's, it's very important to build the right thing. And that's the topic of the rest of my talk, pretty much. Um, good software tools uh, shape research and, and, and give superpower, superpowers. Um, and uh, hardware performance, of course, uh, uh, matters for kind of R&D, where you need fast turnaround to do experiment, experimentation. So when hardware is too slow, software is not really available, or experiments are not easily reproducible. Uh, good ideas can be abandoned. Neural nets were a good idea, but they were abandoned for about 10 years if not more. So then the, the second wave, uh, uh, there was a spring around 2006, if you want. And what happened is uh, a few of us got together and decided we knew those neural nets were a good idea. And we tried to kind of revive the interest of the community in it deliberately. I call this the deep learning conspiracy. And it was composed of uh, myself, Jeffrey Hinton at University of Toronto, and Yosha Benji at University of Montreal. And we kind of got together and deliberately tried to um, can rekindle the interest of the community in those methods. Meanwhile, I, I thought neural nets could be used for practical applications like uh, like uh, driving robots around. So this is a project, that, uh, DAPA project that I worked on uh, uh, between 2005 and 2009 that consisted in using a convolutional net to do what's called semantic segmentation. So by kind of uh, sliding um, a window of view of a convolutional net over a window and asking it to classify every pixel in an image um, as to, in this case, as to whether this pixel correspond to kind of the ground, whether a robot can drive, or an obstacle. You can basically build a map, uh, which is represented here on the top, and then uh, kind of do some planning in this map, and then get a robot to, kind of, to drive around while uh, avoiding obstacles. Um, so this was quite uh, uh, interesting and successful and fun to work on. And this is uh, very similar to some techniques that are used today by autonomous driving systems that uh, you know, are, are, are kind of trained to, to drive cars and sort of detecting obstacles, figuring out where the region of, uh, uh, you know, of the street is, is drivable um, and, you know, annoy, uh, sort of avoid annoying pedestrians that jump in front of it, for example. Grad students, in this case, who 
wrote the code and trained the networks, and so they're pretty confident the robot is not going to run them over. Um, so soon we realized that we could use the same technique to do uh, uh, sort of more sophisticated uh, semantic segmentation, which means labeling every pixel in an image with the category of the object it belongs to. A few data sets with a, a few thousand images started popping up. And so we uh, built a system based on convolutional nets that could do this. And we even designed a, an architecture that we run on an FPGA to run this in real time at about 20 frames per second at uh, you know, 320 by 240 resolution, roughly. Uh, that's, that was called the new flow architecture. Some of you may have heard of this. Uh, uh, mostly designed by Clément Farabé, who was a PhD student in my lab at the time. Uh, we beat, we beat the, the records here in uh, a number of data sets and uh, sent a paper to a major um, computer vision conference. And um, the paper was rejected, despite the fact that the system uh, had better performance in accuracy and was about 50 times faster than the best runner-up, even implementing, implemented in software, not talking about hardware. And the reason was, you know, most reviewers had never heard of convolutional nets and they could not believe that a method they never heard of could work so well. Now, the thing is, this was 2011. Nowadays, you cannot actually get a paper accepted at CVPR, the same conference, unless you use convolutional nets. So that tells you something about the revolution. This is the uh, new flow architecture that I was just, just mentioning. Um, so this was, uh, 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 you know, done, you know, over uh, two or three years between 2009 and uh, 2008 and 2011. And uh, it exploits the structure of convolutions uh, in a big way, sort of to try to minimize the memory traffic and sort of do a lot, you know, as many operations in succession uh, as possible without going to back to memory. So this uses a, a data flow architecture, kind of reviving old ideas in architecture from the, the 1970, uh, 1970s. Uh, eventually, we collaborated with uh, Eugenio Colucello's lab at Purdue and uh, uh, got a design of, for a chip, which was never properly fabricated, so it couldn't be tested. Um, so those ideas kind of um, are, you know, partly what sort of influenced some some of the people working on autonomous driving now, using also semantic segmentation in real time for for that purpose. Okay, so um, the deep learning revolution really occurred around 2012. It occurred a little earlier in speech recognition, but in computer vision, it, it occurred around 2012, 2013, uh, when our, our colleagues at University of Toronto in Jeff Hinton's lab. Uh, used a very efficient GPU implementation on the NVIDIA GPUs at the time of convolutional net that allowed them to train a very large convolutional net with 1 billion connections, essentially, uh, and beat the record on the ImageNet data set, which was sort of a standard benchmark for computer vision. And that really was a watershed moment because the computer vision community basically switched from doing whatever it was that they were doing to using convolutional nets. Um, and since then, we've, been, we've seen a, a huge progress and reduction in error rate on this particular data set to the point now that uh, the error rate is so low that, you know, it's below human, uh, 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 you know, sort of human performance. So, I mean, it's above human performance. And so it's not an interesting data set anymore. Um, simultaneously, the, the number of layers of those networks kind of ballooned. And a typical neural net used in production today has something like 50 layers. And so that's one of the big kind of changes in architectures that, that occurred over the last few years. The, the fact that neural nets are now very deep, uh, relatively large, but there's a lot of work to optimize their memory footprint as well as uh, the, uh, the number, of, the amount of computation that they require. So a typical image recognition neural net today, trying to recognize sort of generic uh, objects, requires about 10 billion operations for a single propagation and occupies, you know, on the order of, uh, you know, between 50 and 100 megabytes in terms of memory, uh, you know, if, depending on the, the, the resolution you use on the weights. This is uh, assuming, uh, I suppose, uh, four, bit, four bytes. Um, so this is a kind of an important uh, question here because companies like Facebook, Google, and others use those convolutional nets very, very widely to do content filtering and content ranking. And so uh, every time someone uploads a photo on Facebook, and this happens several billion times a day, uh, this photo goes through a handful of convolutional nets that perform uh, you know, various tasks for detecting objectionable content, to, uh, performing face recognition, uh, generating descriptions for the, uh, for, uh, for, for the visually impaired, and things like that. Um, so, a significant amount of computation is devoted to doing those things. And this is going to increase as we scale up 
this type of uh, content filtering to live video and upload a video where you want to you know, generate uh, uh, subtitles in real time, perhaps translate the language in real time, things like that. So that's going to put a lot of burden on the, on the hardware there. And you know, this community is, um, it creates demand for work from, from, from you guys. Um, so you know, Computer Vision has done a lot of progress. Um, in the last few years, neural nets that I use now are quite quite large, and they can do things like, without going into details of architectures, they can do things like not only identify objects, but also draw the outline of the objects, and if there are human bodies, to actually figure out the pose of those objects. Um, so you know, you can count sheep with them, or um, you know, you can sort of estimate the pose of human bodies. Uh, this is actually a demo that is lifted off of a, an iPhone. So this is a, a real-time body pose estimator running on an iPhone at you know. 20 frames per second or so. Uh, and this is all open source. Uh, Facebook distributes all that stuff in open source. Uh, you can play with it. Um, of course, there's a lot of applications of this to medical imaging. Uh, and it's one of the hottest topics right now in radiology, which is how you can use deep learning for uh, medical imaging. And I, I see a lot of opportunities there also for uh, uh, you know, hardware acceleration, uh, certainly. Um, so applications in transport, transportation, in health, healthcare, in science. Um, a lot of neural nets are used for physics, for example, analyzing high energy physics results. OK, what do we learn from this experience? Good results are not enough. Making them easily reproducible also makes them credible. So you can have good results, but if you can't allow people to reproduce them, they won't believe them. Um, hardware progress enables new breakthrough. Uh, new breakthroughs. Uh, general purpose GPU should have come 10 years earlier. Sorry, NVIDIA. Uh, you know, you did a good job. But, um, and in fact, it did to some extent. People at Microsoft, uh, Patricia Mars Group in Microsoft, actually started experimenting with GPUs for neural nets back in the mid 2000s, but nobody was interested really back then. Um, but if I have one message for kind of the kind of hardware we, we require today that is different from what we, we currently have is better support for convolutions, because there are regularities in convolutions that really, uh, I think, aren't exploited unless I'm, I'm mistaken and hardware that does not require batching. So there is uh, something now you have to run, you want to run a neural net on the GPU and you want to saturate it. What you have to do is wait for 100 you know, or so of, uh, images to show up and then you run 100 copies of the same neural net in parallel. That makes the parallelization easy and it makes the low level operation you need to rely on a matrix multiplication. And unfortunately, that is going away. A lot of new neural nets that are coming up are not gonna be like that. Um, Open source platforms disseminate ideas, and convolutional nets will soon be everywhere. You know, hardware that uh, very low cost, very low power hardware that you can put into uh, cars, cameras, vacuum cleaners, uh, augmented reality glasses, lawn mowers, toys, maintenance robots, whatever. Those things are going to pop up. Of course, smartphone is a big application. Okay, so what about new architectures? Those that are going to break the assumptions that current hardware uh, makes. And there's four types, really. Memory augmented networks, dynamic networks, graph convolutional nets, and networks with sparse, uh, sparse activation. So memory augmented networks is the idea that if you want a machine to reason, not just perceive, you kind of have to give it a sort of working memory, if you want, uh, some sort of associative memory. And so you have a recurrent neural net, a neural net with loops that can sort of iterate multiple times, and it can access a memory. And that memory is basically a soft RAM chip. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but essentially the, you feed it an address, which is a vector. This address is compared with a bunch of uh, keys uh, using a dot product. Um, it's basically a nearest neighbor algorithm, if you want. And then uh, this generates coefficients that you use to uh, compute a linear combination of values. So think of it as kind of a, a, you know, a RAM circuit where all the gains have been turned, you know, turned down, so everything is soft. And the reason you need it to be soft is because you want to be able to backpropagate gradient through it. Um, this model actually is, is used very widely nowadays in things like memory network, transformer networks, uh, things like BERT, which is a very successful architecture for, neural, uh, for um, uh, natural language processing. Um, second problem, the, the fact that neural nets are becoming dynamic. So instead of a neural net having a fixed architecture, what happens now is that you basically write a program where each call is a call to a module that calls a, a neural net, and the program has conditionals and loops in it. So in fact, the architecture of the neural net varies in a data-dependent way. And that completely breaks a lot of uh, assumptions we can make about how we parallelize those things on, on, on hardware. So here's an example. Uh, this is work from uh, Facebook Air Research in Menlo Park. Uh, you have a picture here at the bottom left, and you also show a sentence to the system. 
uh, that says there is a shiny object that is right of the gray metallic cylinder. Does it have the same size as the large rubber sphere? Yourself, if you have to answer that question, you have to go back to the image and then configure your visual system to kind of detect the right things, right? So this is exactly what this neural net is doing. It's not actually computing the answer. It's computing the architecture of another neural net that will compute the answer, okay? So the architecture of that second neural net is dynamic. It changes in a data-dependent fashion. And that's the future. A lot of neural nets are going to be that way. Um, and that leads to, that has led people to kind of think about the, you know, how are we going to write software in the future, perhaps software 2.0, uh, where we, a program is really kind of a, a dynamically generated graph of computation where the function calls are really calls to a parameterizable module whose function is finalized by, by training. Okay? That may be the future of software. Um, third category, graph convolutional nets, or graph neural nets. So those are uh, uh, neural nets of a new type. It's, it's uh, spawning a new subfield, actually, where the input of a neural net is not a tensor. It's not a multidimensional array. It's a function on a graph. And the graph can change structure at every new data point. And so again, there the, the neural net is dynamic. It, you know, it, it depends on the structure. This is uh, very popular for things like uh, analyzing social networks, uh, you know, chemistry, understanding chemistry, figuring out you know, how to go to, from one molecule to another, where the two molecules will skip, stick to each other, things like that. Um, so that's very promising. Uh, sparsity I'm going to skip. So lessons learned, dynamic networks are gaining popularity uh, for NLP particularly. Large-scale memory uh, augmented networks are, uh, will require efficient associative memory, memory and nearest neighbor um, uh, engines. Uh, graph nets are very promising for many applications. It's still a little bit in the future, but uh, I have high hopes. And perhaps we'll have to say goodbye to matrix multiplication and tensors as the elementary operation there. Um, OK. Um, there's been a lot of uh, things about, about uh, reinforcement learning, that reinforcement learning really is kind of the way people learn, etc. And it works very well for games. Uh, but there's a big limitation to reinforcement learning, which is that it requires many, many trials uh, for it to learn anything. If we were to use the, the kind of standard form of reinforcement learning to train a car to drive itself, it will have to drive, you know, millions of hours and cause thousands of accidents, if not tens of thousands, you know, kill many pedestrians before it learns to drive. How is it that humans can learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of training, mostly without crashing. That's a big mystery. And we need to be able to figure this out because you know, we really like to build much more intelligent machines than we can at the moment, things that will allow us to build uh, intelligent personal assistants or you know, even just a, a robot that has as much common sense as, as a house cat. You know, our most intelligent machines don't have that now. Um, so how do humans and animals learn? They, you know, we learn by observation. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that, that, that you know, we learn a lot of, about how the world works just by observing. And we like machines to be able to do this as well. And so the future of uh, AI, in my opinion, is this idea of self-supervised learning. We just learn by observing, not by acting, not by being told the name of things, but basically by just figuring out how the world works. And we can do this by training ourselves to predict. So a good example of prediction is, let's predict everything that's going to happen in the world, like you know, train a machine to do video prediction, for example. Right? Predict the next few frames in a video from the past few frames, or, or predict the past from the present. Um, and we can do this uh, very efficiently for, for, um, for text, but not so much for video at the moment. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because um, you know, the amount of information that we give to the machine during training at every trial of the machine we, we give a very, very small amount of information during reinforcement learning. We only tell the machine whether it did good or bad. For supervised learning, we get a little bit more information. We, we give it the label or the name of something we show it. Uh, but in self-supervised learning, we're asking the machine to predict everything you can predict from your input that you pretend you don't know. And that's much richer information. So one consequence of this is that the neural nets, once we succeed in doing this, the neural nets we're going to have to train are going to be much, much bigger than the one we currently have. And you guys should smile about this, because this is going to put a lot of demand on the stuff you're building. Um, so you know, the form of self-supervised learning that people use in computer vision consists in doing things like filling in blanks in images or, or doing video prediction in text, which is one situation where it works uh, great. It consists in showing a piece of text to a machine, blocking some of the, some of the words, and asking the machine to uh, uh, basically fill in the blanks. Um, in the words. And that leads to machines that can represent text to a surprising degree of, uh, of accuracy. But there's a problem with this, which is that you have to deal with the uncertainty in the world. When you're trying to predict what's going to happen in the video, there are many different futures. And which of the futures are, are you going to teach the machine to predict? If you show it too many 
uh, examples of, for example, a pen falling on the table. Uh, every time the pen fall in a, falls in a different direction, the best the machine can do if you ask it to make one prediction is predict the average of all the pens that fall in all the directions. You get this kind of transparent pen, you know, in all, all position. That's not a good thing. So representing uncertainty in the prediction is the big technical challenge that the machine learning community f is facing today, in my opinion. Um, the revolution, the next revolution in AI will not be supervised. You can be sure of that. Um, so how do we learn predictive models? It's very crucial to learn predictive models because that will allow our machines to predict in advance what's going to happen in the world as a consequence of their actions. So for example, if we have a self-driving car, it might predict in advance that when it uh, turns to the left and there is a cliff, it's going to fall off the cliff and nothing good is going um, gonna, to is gonna happen. And you'd like the machine to be able to predict this before actually doing it and prevent, you know, prevent itself from doing it. So how do we train machines that, to have world, world models that it can use to, to make predictions in the presence of uncertainty? There's a class of methods called generative adversarial networks that is very promising to do this, which I'm not going to explain, but uh, it basically consists in training two neural nets. It was proposed by Ian Goodfellow uh, a few years ago from University, University of Montreal. And there's uh, stunning results on this. The faces you see here are not real. These are non-existing people that are produced by essentially drawing a random vector from some distribution, running it through a neural net, and out comes a picture of a person, of a non-existing person. Um, here are other examples. This is a project that uh, I've, I've been involved in at Facebook of uh, generating pieces of clothing. Uh, we have you know, some data from a famous uh, uh, fashion designer, and we just trained one of those generative networks on all the things that they gave us, a few thousand images, and it generates those things. Um, designers seem to be inspired by it. Um, so, uh, you know, our brains are prediction machines, and if we were able to do video prediction, we could do things like, so these are examples of using adversarial networks for video prediction. Uh, but if we could do things, we could, we could use this for self-driving cars. We could predict where the cars around us were going to go, and perhaps uh, do a good job at uh, avoiding accidents or train ourselves to avoid uh, accidents. This is a project by uh, Camille Coupri and uh, Pauline Luc uh, at, at Facebook AI Research in Paris. We're not working on self-driving cars, but we're working on prediction. Um, and it works uh, uh, pretty well up to about, you know, a couple seconds in the future, which, uh, you know, is uh, not, not, not long enough. Here is another project which uh, I did at, at NYU uh, under a contract with NVIDIA, actually, who are working on self-driving car, to also kind of train a, a self-driving system to predict what the cars around you are going to do. So you are the blue car, uh, there's a bunch of green cars around you, you've been observing them for a while, and you're trying to predict where they're going to go next. And so you train a neural net to do this with those techniques that allow these neural nets to deal with uncertainty, and you get those kind of predictions. So on the left, for each of the two blocks here, you have uh, what happens in real life. Uh, the second column is uh, what happens if you have a predictive model that doesn't handle uncertainty very well, just predicts one uh, prediction, and the prediction gets blur get blurry after, after a couple seconds. And then the other two columns are using one of those predictive models where you draw different uh, samples of the latent variables so you get different predictions. So if you put the system inside of a, a thing that allows the uh, system to learn to drive, it will actually learn to drive. So you, you sort of unfold the predictive system, you compute a cost function at every time step, you run this for you know, a couple seconds or something. Uh, and this is all in the head of the machine. You don't have to drive an actual car for this. You backpropagate gradient to it and train a neural net to learn to drive so as to minimize the amount of uh, collisions over the next uh, two seconds. And uh, if, if you p play a few tricks to, to deal with uh, uncertainty, oops, in the system, uh, what you get is uh, something like this. So this is uh, the car driving itself. Uh, the little white dot indicates whether the car accelerates or, show, or slows down or turns left or right. And it you know, manages to uh, kind of not crash too often. We're not there yet, but making progress. OK, lesson uh, four, self-supervised learning is the future. Networks would be much larger than today, perhaps have sparse activity. So because they would be very, very large, the best way to represent data in them is to only turn on a small number of neurons. This is a trick that our brains use. Our brains are only about 2% active at any one time. And this is a way to make our brain very power efficient, right? Power consumption of the brain is about 25 watts uh, for, I don't know, 10 to the 18 operations per second or something like that. So, uh, you know, exploiting sparsity is probably something that's coming. Uh, uh, deep learning hardware, there are four use cases for it, right? High-end deep learning R&D, you need 30 to be floating point, high parallelism, fast internode communication, so you can do massive parallelization, flexible hardware and software. Uh, 
Then you have kind of routine training uh, your Facebook and you get you know new data to train your object uh, recognition system or your translation. You just you know want to turn the crank on the standard model. That can be done with 16-bit FP. Um, you, of course, you want to parallelize, but not as much as when you when you are in the R&D loop, and you want the cost to be moderate or at least not outrageous. Um, then there is inference in data centers, uh, and this is increasingly important because of the prevalence of those applications now for for content uh, understanding and filtering, and that will that can work on eight or sixteen bit floating point, low latency, low power consumption, uh, standard interfaces. And the last application, which I think has the biggest opportunities for hardware, uh, the hardware community, is inference on embedded devices that have been very low cost, very low power. Perhaps using exotic number systems have been interesting work at Facebook AI Research in that uh, uh, domain, kind of rethinking how you represent floating point numbers with low, low accuracy. And that would be uh, useful for augmented reality, virtual reality, consumer items, household robots, toys, manufacturing uh, systems, et cetera. Um, my, uh, my last slide is about kind of speculations. Um, there's, there's been quite a bit of work in the hardware community on sort of uh, uh, neuromorphic architectures, spiking neurons. I'm actually very skeptical about this. I'd be interested to, in talking to, to people about this because I'm still very skeptical. Um, and exotic technology, I'm sort of interested in, in learning uh, you know, what some of you have to say about uh, uh, you know, analog, pure analog computations, spintronics, optical implementations, etc. Thank you very much.